Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the digital platform of Shadhan Chandra Mohavidyalaya. I'm back. I, as you know me, I hope that I'm Gautam Maji, assistant professor, as well as head of the department of English of Shadhan Chandra Mohavidyalaya. I'm back with uh, session number 14. Uh, department of English has been organizing uh, this special lecture series, and we have already brought uh, several eminent speaker on our platform. So today uh, I'm back with the uh, session number 14 and uh, in this session we have also got a very eminent speaker and uh, who is the speaker I know uh, you, you know quite well uh, she is Dr. Uh, Modumita Modumda and uh, uh, she uh, before uh, introducing her on this platform on our digital platform I have to tell about her that uh, she is very eminent person in her field and uh, she has uh, contributed to several national and international journals, as well as she has uh, uh, delivered her precious insightful lecture on different uh, platforms. So now I'm going to uh, welcome our Honorable Mohamida Ma'am on our digital platform. Ma'am, welcome. Uh, Ma'am, welcome to our digital platform. Ma'am, could you get me? Are you getting me, ma'am? So technically, I think that has happened. Ma'am, are you getting me? Yes, yes. Okay, your video is not coming. Yes, yes, yes. I'm there. I'm there. Something just went wrong. You are not found on screen, ma'am. It's camera is off, perhaps. Is it, is okay, it okay now? Yes, it is okay. I'm doing this section. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, ma'am, uh, welcome to our digital platform, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation for this special talk. So, if you, ma'am, if you have anything to say about our venture, then we'd we'll be very glad to hear you. About this thing i mean i've been following the, um, this uh, lecture series that you have been conducting and um, i find them that you know because we are coming to share many things with each other so this is the best thing that you can do uh, students and of course you know and uh, the teachers like us are immensely benefiting from it so this platform of sharing is a very good effort on their behalf Thank you very much, ma'am. But uh, before ma'am commences uh, her precious and insightful lecture, then I would like to tell the topic that uh, she is going to delineate with. And uh, today she is going to delineate a very special novel and a very special novel to all of our hearts. Uh, that is uh, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. And the topic that she is going to deal with, that is who is the storyteller? Uh, is, uh, interrogating the narrative voices in Wuthering Heights. So ma'am, uh, over to you. And definitely, if you have any kind of issue, uh, then you can tell me. I'm there. I will listen to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, very good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm here to share some of my thoughts on uh, Wuthering Heights, especially relating to the question, who is this storyteller in Wuthering Heights? Um, to begin with, Emily Bronte's Withering Heights was written between October 1845 and June 1846 and was published in 1847, what we call the Tumultuous Forties in England. And of course, uh, this uh, political, social, economic upheaval does not directly form the background of Withering Heights, but the undercurrents, of course, can be felt when we are talking about the narratorial voices. Lockwood is the primary narrator. He actually introduces us to the story of Withering Heights. So you have the diary, the diary format. Lockwood is an outsider. He is a city great person. He claims that he is somebody who doesn't feel comfortable uh, in this ambience. Uh, when he's talking about Heathcliff, he talks about him as a kind of a 
capital fellow, that's the word that he uses for him. And then when his assumption goes wrong, he does nothing to sort of, you know, augment or better his communication with people. Therefore, this outsider, polished, not belonging to this land of Wittering Heights or to Kashkar's grant, with his language very different, invites us to this very personal space of his diary. So you have this diary being written, and you could see that here is someone that, you know, who is uh, inviting us, you know, to read and, you know, be a participate uh, into this very private space. It was a common methodology in the 19th century novelists to use the diary to write this kind of, you know, uh, uh, stories. And especially with Withering Heights, which begins literally from the end, it helps that this is a diary entry, and then he hears Nelly, and this helps us to complete the kind of circle that Withering Heights story is all about. Before I move on to the other narratorial sensibilities, I would also like to mention another diary entry, which is that of Catherine Earnshaw. Now, Catherine Earnshaw's diary is found by Lockwood. Two things about here. Because I'm talking about Lockwood's analytical, rational approach and his non-emotional involvement, I would remind you of that part where Catherine actually is uh, the diary of Catherine is actually discovered by Lockwood, and uh, reading it, he falls asleep in the bed. So you can understand that he's not emotively very interested in the contents of the diary. But talking about the diary, you would see that there are uh, there are margins. You know, there are things which are being uh, uh, mentioned, and you would have this kind of you know uh, sensibilities being presented. Now, this whole uh, aspect of uh, the diary Am I there? So th this is a minute by minute account of uh, that is being given uh, by uh, Catherine in her uh, diaries. So this reminds me also of the diary entries of Emily Bronte, the author herself. Emily Bronte would be somebody who would um, who would give us, you know, uh, pretty descriptive entries in her diary, but you would not see the self. You will not be able to judge her or form, you know, opinions about her. In a way, the author perhaps shares that sensibility when she gives this entry sensibilities, diary entry sensibilities to Catherine. The other thing about Catherine's diary entry would be that there are scribblings that are being done by her. She talks about being Catherine Earnshaw. She, she writes Catherine Linton, Catherine uh, Heathcliff. Of course, these are like, you know, uh, identity crisis that she's going on. But then there is nothing that she records. It is only when she's talking with Nelly that you will find that she's actually coming up with this kind of uh, confession. I quote, it would degrade me to marry Heathcliff. He shall never know how I, how I, how I love him. It's more myself than I am. Whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are of the same. So there are, these recordings are not being done. So in a way, Emily shares our sensibility with Catherine. Now, coming back to Lockwood, Lockwood, you know, uh, seems to present himself as a kind of a social superior. His sentences are complex and frequently divided by colons, semicolons, dashes, making his style appear more educated. As he introduces himself to Heathcliff, you know, you would see Lockwood say, I quote him, Mr. Lockwood, your new tenant, sir, I do myself honor of calling you as soon as possible after my arrival as to express the hope that I have not inconvenienced you about my pers perseverance in soliciting the occupation of the Pascroach branch. So this is, is a remarkable contrast to the kind of language that we will be 
of course you know uh, uh, in the presentation of of uh, lockwood so if i'm talking about this language you know it is latin it, it, it has a kind of a simple bread educated sensibility something that i need to contrast with nelly and i need to contrast with joseph's language which has a more local language so lockwood's narration is overall very passive very descriptive rather than being emotional he devotes himself you know to give you know such time to the interior of uh, Witherian Heights. So you have you know, his, uh, uh, his appearances of uh, people that is with his head. So he clips uh, life line, time, everything that you know is being told to us, is, of course, uh, through this particular sensibility. Hello, am I audible? Uh, so, narration is overall very factual and more descriptive than emotional. He devotes himself to giving very details of actual accounts of the interior of the withering time and the appearances and the behaviors of the tenants of the house. He falls, sort of giving the reader a detailed description of his feelings or emotions of the Gautam, I think I'm having a little problem with an, a little problem with the sound. Okay, can you just give me a minute? Right now, you're perfect. Right now, you're perfect. Just a second. I think I'm having a little. So now it is okay, no? Yes, it's okay. Very much okay. Audible. Okay. All right. Sorry, sorry, sorry for that interruption. So, uh, uh, so he thinks of the countryside as a Midland Slope's heaven, and of Heathcliff as a capital fellow, as I was saying. So, on trying to get information from Nelly, he reflects that she was not a gossip. I feared unless about her own affairs that could hardly interest me. So while reading Catherine diary entries, you know, he doesn't seem to have that kind of an empathy, but that kind of close-mindedness is not there when, of course, Lockwood has dreams. So Lockwood spends the night in Catherine's old bedroom. It is here that he encounters Catherine's ghost and dreams of Jets. Being both physically and emotionally in the center of withering heights, Lockwood can interact with the supernatural but he quickly dismisses his experience, experience after waking up as merely the branch of a fir tree that touched my lattice. So until the very end, he's not able to get very close to the inhabitants of the Withering Heights or understand the story of their lives. Even when Lockwood is telling us about the diary, I mean, he's, you know, he's recording the diary, he does not give us a reflection of his own persona. There is only at one time within the uh, entry that he talks about, you know, a love affair that he had. Now, this, I think, actually helps because he doesn't carry the baggage of the outside to the world of Withering Heights. The Withering Heights, which is a closed world and is not open to the experience of the other or the outsider. So Lockwood comes with his language, comes with his perception of being the gentleman, comes with the sensibility of being the outsider, but there is nothing that he imposes of that outside within this particular narration. Lockwood fails to understand one thing, that he says that I'm very different from these people of Withering Heights, but that means something, he is like them. How? If you would say when Catherine's ghost attacks him, he becomes cruel and attacks her physically and calls her a creature. So as opposed to the reader, Lockwood fails to perceive these similarities between himself and Heathcliff. He can't see that he can be equally cruel, a cruelty, you know, a quality that he associates with Heathcliff now and then. So when you're comparing, you know, Nellis language with that of Lockwood, of course, she is simple. Uh, shorter sentences, 
unlike Lockwood, she is not in that way, you know, descriptive, but she is also somebody who is, you know, introducing the character to us with their dialects, with their type of language. So, uh, Nelly would remember, remind us of, you know, the English ballads, the narrator of the English ballads, who will take characters and present them accordingly. But the problem is that, that Nene is somebody who is also, who will filter things. She will choose what to present and what not to present. So that is where the narratorial voice of Nene becomes problematic or, you know, you know, the idea that she is perhaps unreliable because she does not have really to everything at Withering Heights. She's an observer, she gazes, she gets inside into things, but she cannot or she does not know the kind of, you know, interaction that had taken place between Catherine and Heathcliff. So the intensity of those romance is unavailable to us because Nelly does not know them. So these are spaces that need to be filled up. So there are both narrators, Lockwood as an outsider, Nelly as an insider. Nelly is a character who is presenting the story from inside. But nonetheless, you know, you will have to understand that she is somebody who will not be able to give us everything. So as a reader, we are allowed to actually have our own impressions. So we read between the lines. So in reading these lines, you know, we also become a kind of a storyteller, a kind of a participant within this process of storytelling. The reader perceives Nelly as an enviable character. She's a servant. She is somebody who is not, uh, you know, she, she claims to be kind of self-educated. But, you know, Nelly keeps on saying that the people at Withering Heights actually seek her advice. It includes Catherine, it includes Isabel. So they have all, you know, asked for her advice. So that, you know, augments her position within the structure of family and, of course, Withering Heights. So she is presenting us with first-hand report, you know, so the reader, you know, will know what has happened, you know, and she has a very dramatic presentation. And therefore, it seems as if she's presenting to us things absolutely as if it has happened a few hours ago. So you have to understand that in this recording, the concept of memory also comes up. So Lockwood is the recorder. She he is getting a kind of a history that is being given to him by Nelly. Nelly is somebody who is using her power of narration. You know, she's choosing what to present and what not to present. And it is this drama that attracts the reader. So, you know, at one point, you know, Lockwood is completely forgotten. It is Nelly Dean as the narrator who seems to be very attractive to us. And that is what is actually happening throughout the story. We'll listen to what Nelly Dean has to say. So Lockwood contributes to the reader's doubt about Nelly, that, you know, whatever Nelly is saying, maybe it's not all correct. Like at one point, you know, he, he talks about Cathy. He remarks, I give you the quote, she does not seem so amiable as Miss Dean, Mrs. Dean would persuade me to believe. She's a beauty, it is true, but not an angel. I unquote. <clears throat> so Withering Heights, you know, comes with po possible hints, Lockwood, because he questions, you know, what Nelly Dane is saying or what, you know, um, uh, others are saying. So he stretches our abilities of the human memory. And his rendering of the outside sources reminds us that Withering Heights, through its narrator, Lockwood is also talking about the creative writing rather than recording. So when you are writing or recording, so you are doing a kind of a creative writing. So it is a kind of a metafiction. So there is a secondary aim in this book. By showing the process of narrating might lead to fabrication, the novel calls into question the mimatic qualities of fiction and abilities. Ultimately, the usefulness of narrative as a mode of transmit knowledge or transmission of knowledge is something that we will have to understand. So we will have to understand that, you know, Lockwood and uh, Nele are transmitter of knowledge. So they are giving us information and they are necessarily not absolute. It is only in between these brief breaks in Nele's narrative that Lockwood's voice is heard directly, allowing the reader to ferret out what sort of character the bulk of information comes from. In order to understand Lockwood, and his motives, 
close attention must be paid to what he sees through what he conceals. So withering Heights narration is all, is also about the process of concealing. So the narrators, that is Lockwood and Neledin, allows the novel to situate itself in the play between non-exclusive fields, in the space of intermediacy between margin and the text. The overt content of marginal narratives gives place to the text embedded between their lines. So the margins, the voices, you know, that are being created, ultimately makes the, the narrative a whole. So I cannot say that Lockwood has told me everything. I cannot say Nelly has told me everything. Or I cannot say Isabel has told me anything or Kathy has told me everything. So I have to take a collection of all these things to actually make my impression of these characters. Although Lockwood is nearly invisible for the majority of the novel or the story, what little he shares in his observation about others is also crucial because Lockwood is using logic as a shield. He fancies himself as somebody of respectable character. He is a kind of a cultivated person. He is a, in a kind of a foreign land. Instead of absorbing what he experiences in an open eye, he views his surroundings with the preconceived notions of a high-brow society and how unconcerned the rural world of Withering Heights is in terms of gentility, of course, problematizing the concept of gentility, which has, of course, deserved, you know, disrupted the lives of Catherine, Keith, Keith, Linton, and others within the novel. It also brings us to a crucial point that you know, Lockwood, in spite of his so-called disinterest, is not able to live in isolation. So one of the major things that the novel actually brings out is the irrefutable effects of both vocational and emotional isolation on individuals and the raw passions that may erupt as a result. So it is Lockwood's fickleness and ignorance you know, of his own character that make him a thoroughly unreliable narrator sometimes because he's making judgments you know, of his own ideas on others. You know, like when he talks about Heathcliff, I uh, quote, he will love and hate equally under my cover and esteem it a pieces of impertinence to be loved or hated again. No, I'm running too fast. I bestow my own attributes over liberally on him, I unquote. So the unconscious desire to belong by focusing on the appearance and not really talking about what lies beneath is a problem with the narrative of Lockwood. So he does not really, you know, look at the emotional quotient of the characters and how they are functioning. Indirectly, he invites the readers then to, of course, investigate it, investigate what lies beneath. So Lockwood is the outsider, but Nelidin is not. Her narration is unique because she's a character who is present for and participates in the action of the story that she narrates. The point of view is that Lockwood hears her and does not read. We are the one who are reading Lockwood. So there is a difference, you know. Lockwood is hearing uh, uh, Nelidin and then he's recording it. On our part, you know, we are reading it. So therefore, the focus of the of the process of reading is often on non-essential things. You know, we look for details, we look for descriptions. These kind of fills are, of course, absent in the narratorial sensibility of Nelly, who will not do it. In this way, Emily Bronte prevents her or herself from coming into the novel. She doesn't want that to happen. So therefore, the technique of Nelly Dean, which is packed with energy, vivid, you know, it's ballad-like, you know, as a vehicle in which we receive this story, her narrative differs from Lockwood in that it consists primarily of dialogue, often true to the different dialects and idioms of the heights inhabitants. Nelly's personal speech, which elevated from that of an average servant in rural England, remains colloquial and approachable. So she is, you know, self-educated. She doesn't exactly talk like the 
rural servant in that way. So her sentences are shorter, less complex, lifelike, even in that way it is imaginative. So there is a sense of urgency in the way that she tells things. So her dramatized narrative does not contain any kind of editorial comments or there is no premediated instructions. The impact is more powerful, therefore, you know, than Lockwood's narration in that way. By this, you know, multiple narratives that I have, you know, of Catherine, of Isabel. Isabel is somebody who feels that the gap of the absence of Heathcliff's stay in withering. Heathcliff is not there for some time. So it is Isabel who actually records and tells of the marriage and, you know, talks about Heathcliff being cruel. Now, Nelly, of course, you know, talks about it because, you know, she had never been fond of Heathcliff in that way. So when Heathcliff actually walked into um, Withering Heights, you know, Nelly was a kind of a foster child and she had a kind of a playmate in England, but she found herself replaced, you know, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Earnshaw especially, you know, would actually instruct her to look after Heathcliff. So therefore, you know, it ends the childhood of uh, Nelly. And of course, it brings, you know, of course, uh, to a kind of a adulthood, you know, and which, which means that she needs to now know her socioeconomic position. And she, of course, doesn't like it. She knows that even Heathcliff, you know, doesn't come from him. She, he has no parentage. You know, uh, but he is not, he's dirty, he's, you know, dark. These are things that she keeps on telling. And this is the reason why she hates Heathcliff. And therefore, you know, when Isabel collaborates that through her presentation of Heathcliff, she is, of course, you know, interested and likes that. She also comes to hate Catherine at one point because Heathcliff comes to replace her in um, Catherine's uh, emotions and space and therefore she also you know uh, doesn't think much of uh, Catherine she's more sympathetic towards Himley but when Himley returns you know after the death of Mr. Earnshaw you know and has married uh, Francis uh, Nelatin is not particularly happy if I'm to look at the story structure in all probability Nelatin's mother had you know nursed Himley and Nelidin. And of course, you know, that had, you know, meant there is a continuity of the stay within the family. This is something, of course, you know, she, uh, uh, she doesn't uh, uh, appreciate, you know, the displacement that has been given to her by uh, Heathcliff. So, but with the coming of Francis, it means, you know, uh, Nelly is around 22 when Catherine is about to get married. So she is also, you know, a character who is of marriageable age. But she's excluded from any kind of sexual or social life that she could have had. Uh, maybe she had wanted or believed that there could be a possible marriage between her and Hindley. You know, it's a kind of a possibility. You know, therefore she's not very happy with the coming of Francis. But you know, she kind of has a sympathy for you know Mrs. Earnshaw, as she calls her, when you know she tries to sort of uh, educate Catherine so that she becomes you know qualified or you know more comfortable within the Linton family. But after her death, she's quite critical of Hindley. And even, you know, goes against him when, of course, Hindley tries to show her and Joseph their position and tells them to move out of the house and go at the back of the house. She seems to have forgotten her, you know, dislike for Mrs. Earnshaw in that way. And finally, you know, what she does is that, you know, she brings up Harriton, you know, as her own son. This is something, you know, which she will like, you know, and appreciate uh, throughout her life. She again begins to hate Heathcliff hate, hate because, you know, she's again sent back to Trash Cross Branch and away from Harriton. And this is something which she doesn't appreciate. So her, you know, presentation of Heathcliff would be a kind of, you know, filled with a certain uh, sort of negativity, you know, and, and she would, you know, be talking from the margin. She believes, you know, she and Heathcliff, you know, had equal opportunities of, you know, rising up the social ladder, something that you know, Heathcliff had made possible for himself. But, you know, that is something that she has not been able to do. Uh, <clears throat> apart from that, you know, um, it is through this rendering of these dialogues, you know, dialogues that Nelly seems to be telling us, you know, you, she seems to be uh, making us or allowing us to interact, you know, 
interject and you know put many current and many voices as one would say within the novel so these are undercurrents these are opposite to each other they do not fuck each other but they actually form you know the multiple voices within the narrative and therefore invite us that you know this text or this novel needs multiple uh, 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 interpretations it cannot be you know having a particular interpretations to it on the other hand, Nelly is not averse to using the troubles of her superiors as a means of pointing up the intelligence and the sobriety of her own mode of existence, and that by shedding light on the moral defects or the foibles of other characters, she makes herself appear by contrast the essence of normality and good sense. So this is how she makes herself accepted. She says, you know, that is why, you know, uh, People should hear her. Otherwise, you should realize that Nelly is somebody who likes to med likes to meddle or has the tendency to meddle in other people's affairs and pass judgment. And this, you know, is sort of her hypocrisy. You know, she sort of even uh, manages to dictate the course of the uh, novel. She seems to be very much aware that you know when she and Catherine are talking about her marriage to Linton that. Heathcliff is there in the other room, but this is an information that she does not give to Catherine and tells her that in all probability he is in this table. And then, of course, you know, Heathcliff hears the most dangerous work about how Catherine intends to marry Linton because marrying Heathcliff would degrade her. He, of course, doesn't stay to hear thereafter what, you know, Catherine has to say. Uh, Nelly sees that, you know, uh, uh, it, it goes from there. This is an information that she deliberately holds back from Catherine. So it is up to us, you know, it is anybody's guess that, you know, what would have happened if this information would have been provided to Heathcliff? What, what course this particular novel would have taken? So in that way, you know, this hypocrisy, you know, this, this, this desire to control, you know, is also there in Nelly's narrative. What becomes fascinating that, you know, for long we have looked upon her as the only narrator, you know, somebody who's passing on what had happened because she had been an, been an insider. She knew what was happening inside and therefore she had a freely to all those things and therefore she could tell us. But by this control, as one would say, she also becomes a potential player within the story. And mind you, she is a servant who is playing this potential role. So there are two distorted views that I now have. One of Lockwood as the outsider, who seemingly does not understand the emotional sensibilities of the people of Withering Heights, and Melody, who seems to be, you know, having her own, you know, ideas and of course choosing what she would tell Lockwood or she would not tell Lockwood. But both of them seem to be affected by their socio-economic position and subsequent emotional states. And therefore, you know, in a way, both of them help, you know, to sort of reduce the cruelty and the moral defunctness that is otherwise the part of the characters that are being presented here. So by removing the voice as an author, that is what uh, Emily Bronte does, and replacing it with the strong emotive language of Lockwood and Ellie Dinn, Bronte allows the story to speak entirely for itself. So this is a tactic that allows the reader to recognize their errors and focus more on understanding the tale rather than judging it by suggesting the personal failings of her narrators. As a servant, she has never been married. She looks upon Heathcliff with disdain and jealousy, and she uses her intelligence to sabotage the happiness of those people around her. What becomes fascinating is that she is thought of Fond of Harriton and Catherine, you know, since she, 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 uh, she uh, says that, you know, I have brought them up. In having brought both of them up, you know, uh, she gives her own, uh, I would say, moral uh, functioning to them, gives her emotions to them. Is that the reason that Cathy and Harriton is able to see the happiness of happily ever after in this Tale which is sorry, which is cruel, which does not seem to grant happiness to anyone. It's a question that I would love to, um, you know, throw at uh, our um, investigation of this particular novel. Apart from it, you know, this novel also talks about 
uh, being a kind of a gothic novel. And what does a gothic novel do? It you know it talks about mystery, it talks about ambiance, it talks about horror, and this kind of description is being provided by Lockwood. He's the one who is giving us you know uh, descriptions and telling us this place is swarming, as we would say, with ghosts and um, and um, other supernatural elements. On the other hand, you know it is Nelly who adds to the horror aspect of the story by calling heat to if you know um, uh, dirty black or you know talking about Catherine being indisciplined but there is you know what gives Nelly this power to tell you you know why does she decide to tell the story to Lockwood is it because Lockwood is interested no she has her own vested interest in that way she's also thinking about Lockwood as a possible master in future of Withering Heights and therefore looking at him as a weak master, she believes that she will be able to manipulate him with the kind of information that she provides him with. Of course, this design of hers does not become successful in the end, but you know, Nelly speaks at one point that Catherine had asked her to keep her secret. In, you know, uh, Catherine, you know, pleads with her and says, Nelly, will you keep your secret for me? But Nelly says that she's not going to do it. In that way, she gains freedom. Freedom not to tell the story as it has happened, but as she wants to tell it. So there is no chronology in the way that she actually tells us the story. She chooses the order herself. You know, and because of that narrative uh, vigor that she has, it comes out as if it has just happened. You know, that I think is the beauty of Nelly's uh, description. You know, when you're talking once again uh, about these various contradictions, you know, um, within the narratorial voices, the many uh, dialects that come out, um, this language, you know, is also in a way an authorial presentation of the uh, the social structure of the amalgamation of the social structure of the many voices within the social structure. So that is what you know he intends to do. So this is very important for us to understand. Uh, again, you know, uh, Nelly Jean has been there as a little girl in Withering Heights. And when Lockwood actually asks her, he's, she says that she has been there for 18 years. So that's a long period of time in that way. The reader then um, can have their own impression of these two narrators. It is of great importance to listen to the direct voices, direct voices of Isabel, of Catherine, of Joseph, you know, the, even of Heathcliff, you know, all these voices account of, you know, give us an account of their lives, which is not contaminated by anything, by visions of any narrators. So these voices, you know, help the reader to understand their state of mind and give an opportunity to follow the change in their perspective. So we are allowed to follow, follow our own opinion. So uh, this is, you know, something which we will have to keep in mind as we are uh, investigating this voice of uh, Nelly Dean and uh, Lockwood. The Gothic novel, which I said, begins with a mystery with a feeling of terror, which is provided by both the narrators, uh, is contributed both by Nelly Dean and, of course, by Lockwood. So. Uh, Ultimately, you know, in uh, towards the end, you know, I would also like to read the narratorial voices, especially that of Nelody, in terms of the socio-political upheavals in that era, where the subordinates do not remain in their position and come to the dominant modes of power. Joseph, you know, um, is insubordinate to his superiors, especially when they're outside the members of the family. It is Joseph who is bringing up Harriton puts in him this pride of that lineage of his own family and tells him that, you know, uh, what he should uh, be thinking of Heathcliff also. So these are the values or even the thought construction which is being put by Joseph in the mind of young Harriton. So Nelidin and Jean, in, uh, you know, Joseph in particular, are invested or vested with the upbringing um, with the children, a power, you know, which gives them a space within the family structure. Joseph, you know, uh, 
puts himself in this family structure and so does Nelly. You know, Nelly at one point says that she's looking after withering eyes, she's looking after the children. A function that should be performed by the mother is performed by Nelly Dean. So rather than the mother raising the children, it is the servants. So even later in the novel, there is a strong evidence, you know, of Joseph influencing the upbringing of Herrick. So Nelly is also a significant investigator of the conflict between the families. So that she observes and gazes and reports, these are also problematic. She is the one who goes back and tells Edgar of Catherine and Heathcliff's, you know, interaction. And that, you know, that is what creates, you know, once again, uh, problems between Clinton and Catherine. You know, she's also somebody who decides and chooses what kind of information she will pass on. At one point in the novel, when Catherine is delirious, she had ample opportunities or a number of opportunities to call Linton for help, which she does not. And even Catherine real realizes that and calls, uh, you know, Nellie a witch and says that you are my enemy. You know, you become my enemy. So both Catherine and Heathcliff sort of become victim in the hands of Nellie Dean because of the kind of information that she gives or does not provide. So Nelly makes this confession, you know, of course, when she's telling this story to Lockwood. But this also tells us that she's in control of, you know, what is happening with the lives of the people in Withering Heights who happen to be her masters. So there are, you know, instances which tell us that Nelly struggles to find her place, her identity among the family members. James Huffley says that Nelly believes herself as rightly belonging to the same social level as the Earnshaws. That is her problem. So Nelly especially places herself among the higher ranks of society as she begins to further in age. She becomes the main caretaker of the grant after Edgar's death, as we know. The fear of servants rising in class is also extremely evident in the case of Nelly. Through her tale to Lockwood, she attempts to fulfill her goals. <clears throat> so she has good reason to tell her story to Lockwood, you know, hoping that in future Lockwood would be the good master. So, you know, Nelly, of course, wants a weak master who will not be able to dictate. So Heathcliff, Hindley, everyone has tried to show her position within the family. That is something that has never gone down well, uh, well with Nelly Dean. The servants in Withering Heights highlight the fears and anxieties of the upper class. The Gothic novel evolved into a warning of the faulty organization of the class hierarchy. And that is what the narrative or the narration that is being done, as one would say, within uh, the um, novel. And this is also being presented to Lockwood as well to us. There was a fear that servants and the lower class would rise in rank and use of power. Servants can achieve higher class through marriages, family, melding, uh, meddling in that way, such was the case with Nelly Dean. Due to the societal fears, the Gothic novel, that is Withering Heights, places servants in position that enable them to increase the horror within literature. So usually what happens, you know, what do we see, you know, servants uh, in the, within the Gothic structure of the novel? They, you would see that they lie, they spy, increase suspense through ignorance because they are striving for a certain social position. Masters, on the contrary, they try to degrade and punish the servants for their insubordination. So you are examining this role of Nelly Dean, you know, who becomes not only a storyteller, but she becomes, you know, a pivotal person who sort of dictates the course of action of the novel, the lives, literally, of Catherine and Heathcliff. Now, talking about the female gaze, you know, uh, talking about, you know, the female sensibility within this narrative voices, Lockwood is attracted, you know, by this portrait of Catherine Earnshaw. Um, he, he um, that is the reason he wants to know, you know, uh, who is Catherine and, you know, how was her life all about? Even, you know, Nelly would say that, you know, there was a difficulty in closing the eyes of Heathcliff, who seems to be searching for that female gaze of uh, Catherine. Nelly herself, you know, provides that kind of a female gaze, you know, she is somebody who is meddling, who is an observer, uh, who is there in everybody's life, who sort of, you know, makes things difficult for a number of uh, people within the novel. But then she is, 
being given her voice. She's a voice from the margin. She's a servant. Uh, she is a problematic voice, especially in the 1840s, in the 19th century, the servant and the rise is a problematic thing. So Emily Bronte, through this you know, voice of the narration that she gives to Nelly is actually raising these questions of uh, problems of the society. There has been afterlives that has been written, you know, about the novels of the Bronte sisters. I, I bring out one case, you know, of uh, Alison Case, who wrote a novel called Neladine, in which, you know, she is the one who's telling us the story. It just goes beyond a few uh, years after the novel actually ends, uh, as far as Withering Heights is concerned. But, you know, she is making Neladine write. So the oral narrative, you know, Neladin becomes, you know, a part of that traditional format of storytelling of oral narration that, you know, she's somebody who tells you the story, you know, through memory. She stretches the human emotion and tells you that memory is something which can be fabricated. You know, I can have a memory of a certain thing in a certain space of time that can change with time. So that is what becomes fascinating. As a reader, every time we read this novel of Withering Heights, you know, we have these layers coming out, layers coming out of, you know, what we think of Heathcliff. You know, will I look at him as just a traumatized lover? Will I see him as a kind of a social and economic uh, victim? Is it the kind of otherness just to do with his social position? Or will I look at Catherine, as Nelly would say, that she is indisciplined, is somebody who thinks only about her, you know, social position, because ultimately the reason that she marries Linton is because that will go with her social image. Or will I look at the fact that she knew that she was that inside voice? Now, when you talk about Withering Heights, you need to talk about children. The children, you know, of course, you know, form the energy of this particular model. So the children in the eye of the storm are needless to say Catherine and Heathcliff. In contrast, Nelly claims that she is the quietness. She says, I'm a kind of an old servant, but she says that she has a kind of a quietitude about herself, making herself amicable, saying that when everything is disrupted, everything is wrong in this world of withering eyes, she seems to be the calmness. She's the one who can bring back everything into control. So this, this ability, you know, is something uh, to be noted, you know, in this narrative voice of Nelly. Finally, who then is the storyteller? Lockwood, yes, he's my primary frame giver. It is he who gets me interested in this place of Withering Heights, tells me things through his diary, shares his diary with us. Neladin, yes, because she records, she is a performer, she gives me the drama, she gives me the dialogues. And because of the dialogues, you know, what happens, you know, the dialogues invite us to look into the psychological aspect of the characters. So in that way, Emily is using a narrative strategy which is way ahead of her time. I'm just not looking at the characters from the exterior, something that Lockwood does, but also from a very psychological point of view, looking at it from the interior, you know? And that is a kind of an invitation Nelly Dean's multiple record of the dialects actually give us. And yes, we readers are also the storytellers. It is we who say that Catherine and Heathcliff were deeply in love. We have no record of what kind of a relationship or what kind of a dialogue might have transpired between them. We take that one sentence of Nelly Dean, I am Heathcliff, as Catherine famously says, to determine you know, the whole emotive uh, psychological fabric of Catherine and Heathcliff and make it an immortal story. So we are the ones who are also attributing to this idea of making the story that Withering Heights intends to tell us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, ma'am, for this uh, wonderful, intriguing session that you have uh, through your lecture uh, that you have presented. So, ma'am, this is our question and answer session that is uh, uh, commencing right now. So, we have got uh, a few questions. So, I'm taking the question on the screen so whether you can, you can get the question on, the, on your screen. Or if you can't, then I can edit out for you. So I'm taking the question on the screen and I hope that you can get it easily. So ma'am, could you read it out on the screen from Devnita Chakraborty? Uh, she says, great session. Wanted to ask Modumita why she thinks Emily Bronte chose to have a layered narrative structure. What are the effects she was hoping to achieve? 
Uh, I think uh, for this, I need to go a little bit into the lives of the Brontes who were, you know, uh, uh, living at uh, Howard and, you know, who were living lives in isolation. And uh, of course, with not much exposure, you know, they only had the family for uh, their company. So, you know, the desire to hear many voices, you know, what this, uh, you know, society could be was perhaps something that was always there in the imagination of Emily. She she was never, you know, somebody who would tell, you know, us about herself, you know, her diary entries or whatever is available to us, you know, are rather, you know, uh, captures, captures of what she sees around her. So, you know, it is this multiple narration, then it becomes normal to a person like her, because she would want the multitude of all that is around her to be captured so that, you know, it becomes a process of her, you know, expression, it becomes a process of her expression. So that is the reason I believe why she chooses this very multi-layered uh, format of storytelling. Okay, uh, thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for this answer. Uh, I hope that Devnita Chakraborty has got her answer. Um, okay, there are several uh, messages we have got about your lecture. Uh, several people are very enriching session. Okay, if you have any question for ma'am, then you could just ask by Dropping your comment. Uh, okay. Okay. So I basically I'm telling all of you who are commenting over here. I'm not taking those messages uh, bearing wishes and congratulations ringing on the screen. Just all the questions I will take on the screen. So I have got another question from Shreyan Das. I'm taking the question on the screen, ma'am. Uh, Shreyan, Shreyan Das has asked one, social and economic conditions, can you please explain yes, the point? Yes, you know, uh, the, the socioeconomic conditions, to put it very uh, simply, this was also the time when um, various laws were being introduced uh, in England. You know, of course, you were talking about rights, and it is also, you know, uh, the consequences of the industrialization, which was, uh, you know, hitting the otherwise very conventional Victorian society, which was very conscious about class hierarchy, but class hierarchy itself could be broken. So, you know, that it's not necessary that you have a pedigree, you know, uh, to be, you know, be successful. That is something the, which the character of Heathcliff does. You know, he is somebody without parent. You know, it, it is not necessary whether you know the parentage of Heathcliff or not, or what his parentage is. But what is important, you know, Heathcliff becomes a self-made person. He's comes back and even gambles and, you know, takes things from the rightful owner that is Hindley. And therefore, you know, uh, he becomes the kind of, you know, the new bourgeois class who is able to rise uh, on his own ability, something that, you know, Nelly seems to be holding against Heathcliff, that she's not able to, you know, hold her own position and have what she would have otherwise desired. You know, she you know, th these are uh, critics who have suggested that Nelly, you know, sort of seems to be very unhappy with the idea that, you know, uh, Catherine and Heathcliff, you know, especially Heathcliff would move to a kind of a happy ending um, um, uh, where whereas she is left behind. But, you know, ironically, she is also the one who sort of, you know, uh, when Heathcliff returns after, you know, and, and returns and then, you know, this memory of Catherine that is there, you know, in the memory of Heathcliff uh, around uh, him, is all once again because of Nelly. You know, Nelly does not say anything negative about Catherine to Heathcliff. So that keeps the memory of Catherine burning in Heathcliff. So somewhere down the line, you know, Nelly seems to sympathize with the fact that, you know, Heathcliff has made it where I could not. So, you know, the and of course, as a servant, you know, Nelly has been repeatedly, you know, uprooted, told that, you know, this is where she does not become. She needs to go back to the backside of the house. So she cannot be within the room except when she's, uh, uh, you know, called for. Therefore, you know, throughout, you know, her narrative, you know, you see this insecurity. She's kind of attempting to find out something, you know, which will allow her to have you know, more specific control, something which she hopes will happen once Harriton and Cathy become the owners of Withering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange, because she has brought them up. You know, she has always claimed that people have asked for my opinion, but have they performed according to her opinion? But now she believes maybe that is going to happen. This maybe, you know, actually talks about the changing social conditions, especially the Bronte sisters, you know, who were daughters of evangelical 
uh, priest, you know, their father, they, of course, you know, the father knew that maybe, you know, <clears throat> their daughters will not probably have the kind of uh, marriage security or things were not going to be uh, plentiful for them, you know, thought about educating them, you know, you know, and you know, all the Bronte sisters, you know, the writing Bronte sisters, I would say, the writers in that way, all of them had been governesses, you know, earning their livelihood, using writing as a process, you know, of earning their own livelihood. They were published in that way. So uh, it talks about, you know, uh, to understand the changing socioeconomic position in terms of women, in terms of class hierarchy, everything needs to be understood. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so I'm taking the next question on the screen. Uh, Disha says that if uh, instead of Neri Jane, if the writer has said the uh, narrator, uh, then will Udri Heights be that much interesting still now? Now, look, this is a difficult question. I, uh, it's very, very difficult to say because uh, Emily did not go on to write another novel. It is uh, very difficult to say uh, what her um, strategy would be if she was an omniscient uh, narrator. But I think I prefer Neladin, you know, this, this voice from the margins, you know, this has been a kind of a thing that has always come up in the afterlives of the novels written by the Bronte sisters. You know, if you remember White Sarah, this is C, you know, talking about Bertha, you know, she is the one who becomes one of the primal voices within the uh, uh, novel. So, you know, uh, Neladin, you know, somebody you don't expect, you know, she's, you know, as I, as I was talking about the oral traditional format, I was talking about her, you know, within the English uh, folk ballad system, you know, she's somebody who is the transmitter, she transmits it. But, you know, by giving Melody the choice of what she wishes to transmit, what she wishes to uh, share and not share, she tells Catherine very directly that I'm not going to keep your secret, you know, I will tell if I wish to, and that is the reason why she's telling this story also to Lockwood. All these things, you know, makes it very fascinating. You know, and the multiple ballet, the, the, uh, the process of, you know, uh, to uh, imitate is so, you know, there in Nelidin, and therefore she's able to, you know, capture the dialects of the other. So if there was this authorial voice, you know, I don't think if the, the, this kind of multiple uh, voices in terms of dialect, you know, which also helps us to locate them uh, socially, as well as, you know, understand their emotional responses to a lot of things would be possible. So I think I prefer it this way, that, you know, it is Nelidin and Lockwood in a way, you know, two very opposite, one very sophisticated city bred man, the other, you know, self-educated and wanting to rise, you know, uh, in power by the virtue of this ability to tell the story and to capture the attention. That, I think, is is, is perhaps, you know, the uh, beauty of this novel, and I would prefer it this way. Well, thank you, ma'am, for your answer. I hope that Disha has got her answer. Okay, there is another question. Uh, this is from Roshni Sarkar. Ma'am, you said Emily is using the narrative in a way ahead of time. What does this mean? Will you please tell us? Now, uh, in the 20th century, what would be very famous is the psychological novels. You know, you're talking about what is, you know, when there is certain actions being uh, taking place, you're also talking about the mind. You know, usually the 19th century uh, novels are about, you know, dialogues and you just, you know, um, present them as they are. So uh, this has been usually the process. But by, you know, uh, within the snippets of, you know, narration that is largely of Nelidin, by giving voices within it, you know, you are talking about, you know, a possibility of a drama. Then you automatically question, what were these characters thinking? You know, what might have been in their mind when they were saying this? Or what, what might have been their intent as they were saying it? You know, this kind of a psychological investigation uh, is something that is only possible because of this narration. And that is why I said that, you know, in that way, she opens up a possibility that was a kind of a reality of many of the narrative techniques that we had in the 20th century novels. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. It's um, quite a long question. Uh, Devarati is asking, ma'am, uh, the inflections that he did imparts over the character, does it reveal his frustrations of being considered as a gypsy boy belonging to a lower social position by answer over and over again? Yes, I mean, like the turning point for Heathcliff, you know, Heathcliff, you know this novel, you know, through its uh, through its two narrators, 
tells us that you know you can't live in isolation and if in isolation you are likely to have emotional disruptions and you are going to erupt emotionally now heathcliff's only companion was catherine after the death of mr earnshaw mrs earnshaw never really accepted heathcliff and of course you know uh, nelly dane or hindley are never uh, uh, fond of heathcliff so his only companion is catherine so she becomes isolated because of this you know uh, social economic uh, pressure i would say which comes in the form of linton before her she realizes that she cannot marry heathcliff so it is taken away from him his only companion so it is the frustration of being completely isolated one of the reasons you know lockwood who keeps on saying that you know i am an outsider i am not interested i do not understand the kind of you know these people withering heights you know people who do not seem to respond to the concept of gentility seems to talk about nelidine as an old friend he wants to hear from her because he can't live in complete isolation you know heathcliff you know uh, doesn't literally talk to him when he comes in he uh, says that you know walking that is the only thing and there is no more sharing uh, so you, you need to have some kind of a company so it is this lack of company being always you know being kept in isolation not being communicated to is the core reason that frustrates heathcliff and this is you know where he keeps on you know lashing out against each other so you know whenever you know people seem to have company or you know find some kind of happiness this is something which disturbs heathcliff ultimately he realizes that his companion and only friend is catherine and this cannot be met in this life but in the other life you know therefore he almost stares at his death so um Yes, in a way, social economic conditions do do, of course, frustrate him. Okay, um, let me just take another question. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have a few more questions left. So this is from Devjani Adhikari. Hope you can find on your screen, uh, ma'am. The fact <laughs> the Navy expresses her light in the match between Catherine and Hareton. is it only because he is happy for the happiness of catherine out of love for her or is it because he can rather have this new masters under her manipulation to some extent i think i partially answer this question uh, i said that you know uh, because both cathy and the heritage seems to be have been brought up by her you know she calls and says that these are my children you know naturally that kind of an instinct you know the motherly instinct that you know her children will be happy is there so that is one part of uh, the thing you know one part one way to look at it the other of course you know uh, nelle because of this whole 18 years of experience has realized that she has to learn to um secure her position she has to manipulate the emotional dependence of her masters on her this is something that she has learned she hopes that hereton and cathy being much younger to her will not be the kind of quintessential rebels that catherine and heathcliff have been so she is in all probability some three years senior to heathcliff so you know the kind of antagonism or kind of a tussle that was there between heathcliff and her is non existent between uh, hereton and uh, catherine and herself and with time with age of course you know this kind of acceptance has also come to nelly and therefore you know she's happy that you know at least you know her position in the household is secured you know nobody will be able to drive her you know you have to understand the insecurity of nelly number of masters change you know mr earnshaw himley heathcliff you know masters keep on changing and every time nelly has to ensure that she is indispensable to this household of withering heights and trash can scratch thank you uh, we have uh, another question ananna datta uh, does family uh, sorry does emily bronte depicts marginalized marginalization in society through nelly den but not through lockwood's relation both yes nelly is you know uh, uh, the queen's essential uh, marginalized character lockwood's narration you know is the sophisticated so called dominant voice by making him literally absent for most part of the 
you know, narration and making him somebody who is like a recorder, who records whatever Nelly tells him. So, you you know, there is no possibility of Lockwood actually trying to manipulate the story. Maybe he condenses it sometime, you know, but otherwise he takes what Nelly says. You know, it's a kind of a record. By making him a kind of a recorder, this so-called dominant educated voice is also marginalized in this concept of narration you know that the narrator needs to be somebody who is you know educated all knowing you know and should be uh, in this kind of uh, mental frame this is something which is i think debunked through the character of lockwood so it is another kind of marginalization that uh, emily bronte does to her narrator Um, there is another question from Koushiki Mahato. Ma'am, with the exception of Joseph and Nelly, the other servants like Gila and or Michael are very professional. What can be the possible reason for dissent among these two particular characters? Uh, Joseph and Nelly are given, you know, more importance, you know, you know the kind of even uh, religious teachings that Hedditon gets is because, you know, through Joseph. So they have this kind of hierarchy within the servants. So that is the reason why, you know, they get more primal uh, importance or there is kind of a discontentment. The others are like servants mentally. You know, Nelly, you know, finds it very difficult to accept that she's a servant. You know, or that she has to be the servant figure. So it takes her a lot of time, you know, to negotiate and even understand this. Joseph, you know, is muttering when he's asked to bring the horse of Lockwood. You know, he's peevish, he's muttering under his voice. He's displeased. You know, he's old and, of course, doesn't uh, think that it, you know, it should be his duty to actually serve a young Lockwood. So these are the reasons why I go discontent, you know. But at least you let this discontented voice be heard. So, especially within the Gothic structure, as I was saying, you know, they, they are like, you know, horror figures, you know, they're liars, they are like spies, etc. But, you know, nobody hears what they have to say. So, you know, you get an insight into the kind of lives that Nelly and Joseph is living. So, on one hand, I have been prevented, you know, or I have not been given, you know, the, what could be the internal lives of Catherine and Heathcliff. You know, it, 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 this is something I must imagine. I must extend my memory. I must, you know, uh, 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 collaborate, you know, and find out, you know, uh, look into many things and find out, you know, what these people could be thinking or could be doing. But whereas, you know, Joseph and Nelly, you know, are concerned, I exactly know, you know, what they feel about many characters, what are their opinions of the other characters. So uh, so in that way, it is a credit to their intelligence. You're saying that they're not uh, people with, you know, absolute no intelligence or ability to comprehend. So that is the reason why Joseph and Nelly seem to be more um, discontented than the others. So uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for all the answers that you have given. And, and thank you very much for this uh, very enlightening and intriguing session that you have gifted us. And I hope that all the students and as well as other uh, people who have interest in Wuthering Heights, they have also uh, learned a lot from this session. They have enjoyed this session thoroughly. And um, so, ma'am, uh, I would like to say you uh, once again, thanks for uh, this session. And I hope to get you uh, on our digital platform uh, ladder whenever I, I think that whenever we need, uh, definitely you will be there for us. So, ma'am, thank you very much. Stay safe, stay well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. But for the viewers, thank you very much for, the, for joining us and uh, for a constant uh, support for our uh, this series that has been going on for a long time. And uh, for your kind information, I'd like to inform you that uh, uh, 9th of August at 7 p.m. There is another session, which is session number 15. Uh, in this session, we're going to get uh, another guest, uh, Devashish Lairi, Professor Devashish Lairi from Lal Baba College. And uh, he's going to deal with the T.S. Eliot. Uh, so be there. Uh, be That means you have to, if you'd like to just uh, in touch with our, that session, you have to tune in uh, this uh, platform on 9th August at 7 p.m. Till then, tada, bye-bye, stay safe, stay protected. Good night.